My own view in the area of abortion is that I am opposed to it as a matter of birth control or otherwise. The subject of abortion is a valid one, in my view, for legislative action. Opposition to Sandra Day O'Connor's Supreme Court nomination came from conservatives questioning her position on Roe versus Wade. Once confirmed, O'Connor became the court's wild card in countless opinions, including abortion rights cases. And welcome back to Square Off. We're talking to Evan Thomas. He's written a page-turning biography of Justice Sandra Day O'Connor. It's a great read. I want to step back from the opinions for a minute. Uh, you draw a very vivid picture of Phoenix in the 1950s and 60s, a certain universe of life, country club Republicans, and also life at the legislature. Uh, why was Phoenix, because the, the, the O'Connors, John O'Connor and Sandra Day O'Connor, when they got married, could have moved different places. Why was Phoenix so well suited to them? Land of opportunity. You know, they, in San Francisco, everything, have, everybody has a place already. And that was John, John O'Connor. That was John O'Connor. He's from San Francisco. You come to Phoenix and it's all new. And they, they could rise, and they did. He becomes the big man in, in the big law firm. She becomes a political power. They were kind of a golden couple here. Uh, they had tremendous political power just as a couple. And we want to give John O'Connor his due. Yes. Because in time, he became the, the first husband. Yes. He, he was a force in Phoenix. And he had, a, you know, not that easy in the 60s to be married to a powerful woman. He wasn't deferential to her, but he loved her and supported her. And they were a team. He helped lobby to get her on the U.S. Supreme Court. Yeah, it was more than love and support. He was a real asset. He was, to her he was an operator. He, he, was, he, was, he, he was a deal maker. He knew how to work behind the scenes. And so eventually she makes her way to the legislature. I believe she was appointed to she a She was seat. appointed to fill a vacancy. Uh, then she had to run. Uh, then elected majority leader. First ever woman in the United States to be the majority leader of a state senate. And there was even talk at one point of her running for governor. There was. Uh, and, and there's some rumors about that and how that all ended up the way it did. She, uh, uh, the theory was that uh, Governor Babbitt put her on the court so that she wouldn't run against him. I was never able to actually prove that, but there was a lot of winking that went on there. There was. Um, and she, I mean, you, you, you get some uh, notes, or maybe from her archives, what she said at the time, which was, oh, I could have taken him. Yes. Yeah, she, she's and, a proud and competitive woman. She said, uh, you know, there was no deal, but, but she said, I could have taken him. And so talk about the competitiveness and what was motivating her through this period? Was she an early feminist? Was she, where did she stand? What kept her going? Where did that drive come from? She wasn't a conventional feminist. You know, she wasn't out there, uh, you know, this is a, a women's lib type feminist. She got along fine with men. Uh, she was non-threatening in a way. She knew how to, she knew how to flirt with men in a non-sexual way. Uh, but she was driven by a deep desire to public service. I know it sounds corny and hokey, but she really was driven by this desire to, to do good for the country and for the state of Arizona. So let's jump ahead to the Supreme Court. Um, and this, this, this next question spans a big part of her life from uh, college to, to the court. Uh, but one of the unexpected gems in your book is the discovery of a letter from William Rehnquist to Sandra Day O'Connor when... They were students at Stanford Law. I believe he still was a student. He had just left Stanford okay. Law. But, but any, I'm, my wife Osi and I are going through these boxes of letters because I had access to her correspondence, and there are 14 love letters from Bill Rehnquist to Sandy Day, as she was then, and one of them is, Will You Marry Me, Sandy? They had never told their families about this. Neither the O'Connor family nor the Rehnquist family knew about it. I was the first to find it. It was just in a box of papers. I think they didn't, Rehnquist and, and, and Justice O'Connor wanted to keep it secret because it would be embarrassing to them in their later life, certainly embarrassing them when they got on the court. And she turned him down. She turned him down. She was already in love with John O'Connor. Her true love was John O'Connor. And she had four propositions or marriage pro yes, proposals? Yes, this was the early 50s. I mean, she was a very cute girl, what can I say? And she, there were a lot of guys. And very smart. On, and very smart. And, and, and so she, had, she was proposed to four times. So the Rehnquist relationship gets kind of complicated because as her name comes up as a potential first woman on the bench, he lobbies for her. He does, behind the scenes. Somewhat unusual for a sitting justice to be lobbying the administration. She had actually lobbied for him when he got, got on the court in the 70s. Now she, he's lobbying for her. But when she gets to the court, he's a little standoffish. In fact, there's a, I don't exactly know why, but I know that Justice Blackman 
uh, who sat next to Jun Justice Rehnquist, that when Sandra came on the court, Justice Blackman said to Jun Justice Rehnquist, now no fooling around. <laughs> so, you know, who knows? But at the end, it gets complicated. There's a feeling that they left, she left the court before he did, but there's a feeling that he may have bluffed her to leave the court. Yes, I, there's a whole conspiracy theory that he actually bluffed her off. He, he had cancer, he was dying. And, and, they, and she wanted to leave the court to take care of John, who had Alzheimer's. So they both have a difficult personal situation. They don't want to both leave at once. They're talking for a long time. Finally, Rehnquist says, I'm going to stay. Uh, Sandra says, I'm going to go and resigns that afternoon. Huh. Did, but she thought she had a little more time. She could have served. Well, she regretted leaving because John, tragically, within six months, barely recognized her. He's in a home. She yeah. can't take care of him. He forms a mistaken attachment to another woman. It's a, it's a heartbreaking thing. Yeah. And she was still a powerful figure on the court. She was, they called it the O'Connor Court. So she knew she really gave some, she said it was, a, in retrospect, a mistake. Um, so let's talk about the O'Connor Court. You've already said 330 swing That's votes right. in a yeah. quarter century on the court. Yeah. She yeah. kind of redefined swing voting. Yeah, she sure did. She didn't like that word swing vote because it makes it sound fickle. Yeah, but... Uh, well, but, is, but is that fair? Was she fickle? No. She, was, she had a kind of principal pragmatism. Her measuring stick was not some grand judicial theory. It was how is this going to affect real people? And how does it affect the court's place in America vis-a-vis -vis the national mood? That was her guiding light. And I want to talk about two opinions. The first one, uh, opinions related to Roe versus Wade. How did she finesse her decisions on abortion rights because she did protect yeah. Roe versus Wade while she was on the court? The way the compromise she found was to allow states to put some restrictions on, not total restrictions. She protected the fundamental underlying constitutional right to, to have an abortion, but she, she came from a state, right? She came from a state legislature. She realized the states had to have some control over whether you need to get a doctor, notification, things like that. She upheld. So she upheld that, and then there's Bush versus Gore in her final years on the court. And in your telling of it, she doesn't appear to be very proud of what she did Shh. with that vote. This is a woman of no regrets, or certainly few regrets. But on this one case, it, was, it, it made the court look bad. Look, it was five, five Republicans against four liberals. It looked like it was political, and she knew that was going to hurt the court. But she also understood that if that, the vote, if the recount went on, it was going to be a car wreck, and it was going to come back to Congress, and ultimately Bush was going to win anyway. So she, in typical cowgirl fashion, seized the bull by the horns, said, let's end this now. Having done that, took a lot of heat, and she felt some regret about it. She did say publicly once, you know, maybe we should not have taken that case. Maybe we should have said goodbye, let the recount go on. And you spoke to her just a few years ago. Yep. She told it. me, said, I may have had some regrets, but regrets don't do you much good. So what is her legacy on the courts, in the legal field, uh, in America? Well, being the first is an, uh, just an enormous legacy. But this idea that she held to of civility, that we have to get along with each other and that we have to find compromises and we have to treat each other with honor, that is almost a quaint idea in Washington today. It, it's, it's, it's out of favor. It's going to come back because people like Sandra O'Connor are going to be remembered. All right. Evan Thomas, thanks so much for joining us. Great, Great conversation. Great Again, the book is First, the Biography of Sandra Day O'Connor. I really enjoyed it. And you can find it at your local bookstore.